Welcome to the Beyond Normal Podcast. It's your host, Kenny Groom. I'm excited to have a conversation uh, with everyone listening today, just me and you. Um, today, I'll be taking a step back um, to dive more into my background and the purpose behind me starting the Beyond Normal Podcast. I want to start out, you know, just, um, you know, telling you all a little bit about my background. You know, I grew up in New Haven, Connecticut um, with both my parents. Um, you know, I add that note about having both my parents. Um, because, you know, I think that was one of the, the most impactful uh, things in my life growing up. You know, both my parents from both ends, they both had nine to five, but they always, you know, told me about having uh, marketable skills, even from a young age, the age of uh, four or five, six, you know, they were putting those values into me. Um, and they specified, you know, I got to leverage school um, to get there. Um, and so at a young age, you know, from a school perspective, I took uh, to numbers, you know, um, thinking of those math and those science courses, uh, physics, things like that. Um, and really just how those numbers could be used to measure just about anything in our day to day lives. In addition to that, um, I was the uh, product of a uh, education system in New Haven, Connecticut that really, um, you know, promoted uh, black culture. Um, you know, I had teachers um, that looked like me, you know, majority of the classes that I was in, you know, middle school, high school, my peers looked like me. And, and uh, so in that, I, I believe um, that allowed us to have courses, you know, around um, African studies, just studying different uh, countries and dialects and just learning about, you know, all the, all the things that people like me have added. Um, um, throughout history to um, different societies. And I, I think that's something that has impacted me um, deeply. I ended up migrating um, my later teen years uh, with my mom and my brother. Um, and my mom really wanted to use, um, you know, this as kind of a new start for us in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, where her and her uh, peers decided, you know, that would be a good hub for us as a family. Uh, it was really supposed to be a fresh start, you know, New Haven, Connecticut. Um, you know, Connecticut in general is just kind of expensive. Uh, it's colder there, so we wanted to get away from that snow a bit. Um, moving to the South was definitely a culture shock because the only other times I had been to the South to visit my family members in, say, North Carolina and Florida, um, it was just a visit, right? It was just there temporarily and not, you know, being there, having that as my home, um, not really understanding each other initially because the, the different uh, – the different uh, ways we say certain words or pronounce certain words, um, you know, and me just being down here, you know, it was, a, it was an adjustment period, um, but I made it through that in my later teen years, um, and later transitioned into um, UNC Charlotte, um, where I, you know, ended up uh, graduating with a degree in mathematics. Again, you know, that focus on numbers, um, you know, led me down to kind of the STEM path there. Um, and so in earning my degree, you know, you know, in uh, 2011, 2010 timeframe, I really did the same thing that a lot of my peers did. I applied for hundreds, if not thousands of jobs, um, trying to get my first gig in the market, you know, being a, um, you know, just wanting to wear, you know, wear that hat as an adult, being self-sufficient. And so I got my first gig. I ended up at a, a small um, consumer lending company in the auto space in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Uh, Spartanburg, uh, South Carolina, if you guys aren't too familiar with it, that again was, you know, that's in the deep, you know, that's in the South, right? Um, you know, two, two, three stoplight downtown, you know, one of those towns. So for me, it was even a bigger uh, culture shock moving from Connecticut to Raleigh. Um, Raleigh is somewhat of a big city, but then moving to a city that's really embedded in the South. Um, again, like I said, you know, a couple stoplights um, at the time when I was there, not much to do um, in terms of entertainment downtown. Um, that was something of, that was a culture shock for me. I really just had to focus in and hone in on my, my craft and that job. And, you know, me getting that role there, um, I focused on the uh, data analytics piece in that on that uh, consumer lending role there. So that was really what started me down this path, all right, taking the STEM uh, background and then moving into you know, analytics, which at the time, you know, early 2010s, that was really becoming somewhat of a hot topic. Um, so really, uh, you know, 
that's what really started my kind of journey in the the uh, consumer lending space and that's a space essentially i've been in uh you know since 2011 really my entire career uh post graduation from uh, uh unc charlotte um i've just uh, been within that space exploring different industries so like i said i started out in auto ended up uh going into uh somewhat of a revolving credit space you think that every day the visa and the master cards that you use and even spent some time in the securitization space which i think was uh, really eye-opening because you know the purchases that me and you make every day um, whether it be the car whether it be us buying a t-shirt whether it be you know us transacting with whatever businesses we are within our community um, a lot of times those uh, those those uh, swipes of our card, right? They're essentially bundled up by some of these bigger banks that we know. Uh, no need to kind of um, highlight the big banks. I think we can all agree with that. But yeah, just those big banks, right? You know, they take those purchases that we make and they bundle them up. And you know, they can bundle them up all the way up to say, you know, a billion dollars, right? If not more, and uh, pretty much sell that billion dollars worth of kind of asset. Um, in terms of stream of income, and they sell that for money today um, with those purchases um, kind of being paid back over time. So really learning kind of the wing-to-wing -wing process of Kenny as a consumer goes into a store, like I said, and makes a purchase, and then how the banks actually kind of feed that ecosystem so they can ultimately uh, facilitate as many of those swipes for Kenny and, and others uh, within the space, uh, within any, within any, within any industry, right? Um, so fascinating to see there. But one thing I did notice, and I have noticed within my time in this space, is that education, um, you know, in terms of financial literacy, um, a lot of times it's lacking. You know, I was, uh, I was uh, blessed, I would say, to be able to have conversations with my family at a young age, with my parents, with the. You know, I pretty much had an army of aunts and uncles as well uh, that were there to kind of, you know, have some of those conversations with me. Um, and a lot of times the conversations, you know, ended up being, you know, with me coming, being in the credit space now, they were, they were very beneficial for me because they told me, look, don't ever let, you know, anybody mess up your credit. Like, don't ever, you know, let anybody use your credit, you know, things like that. And so I was told that from a young age and those things just stuck, stuck with me. But I would say overall, just broader financial literacy um, in terms of, you know, you know, having an account with money in it, having savings accounts, having these different kind of investment vehicles. Um, there, there's some opportunities there, and I'm glad there's some light being shined on, uh, you know, just the, some of the discrepancies that we're seeing and the way, you know, different uh, minority groups are, are lended to. Um, but I feel like, um, you know, this is my way of kind of giving back, right? With me being in that consumer lending space, making sure I can kind of get some nuggets when I have conversations with uh, entrepreneurs um, and they're thinking with that right mind frame. I, that's, you know, I want to make sure that I'm highlighting them so that they can inspire others. Um, the other thing about, uh, you know, financial literacy and just, you know, minorities in general, um, that I've seen in this uh, kind of lending space is kind of, you know, the idea of owning your business, owning assets um, that you could pass down to your, to your, uh, you know, generations to come. And I feel like the idea of um, owning, you know, owning a business, you know, that's something that's not easy. It's not for everybody, but those who are willing to grind it out and have that asset, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna be the ones positioned um, cause they're going to have a crash course in financial literacy a lot of times because we just don't, we don't, one, we don't, we're not used to the assets, uh, the educational assets that come along with financial literacy, going to the bank, having those conversations, they can be difficult. But then ultimately as, um, you know, as, as you have more history, as you have, um, more exposure to these different financial instruments that we have at our disposal, whether it be cash, savings accounts, investments in stocks and bonds, uh, loans, you know, you, you kind of learn through trial and error with a lot of these things. And, um, you know, I can only, you know, set, just reiterate, you know, I, I commend all the business owners out there, the five business owners that I initially started beyond normal podcast with, um, you know, they have, uh, really 
opened up some eyes, I believe, within their space. And then, you know, with my listeners as well, just in terms of all the things that go into being a business owner, wearing those different hats and um, just really owning their financial um, independence, I would say, um, there. So, you know, I want to dig a little bit into, you know, you know, that's my background, but what really kind of made me go out, you know, jump out there and say I wanted to start this podcast. You know, as the uh, COVID situation started happening, um, kind of unfolding in front of all of our eyes, um, you know, I just wanted to put, a, put, put some highlights on, you know, financial security and that that's a goal for a lot of people, right? But they just don't know how to go out and earn that financial security, right? by having their own business, right? So I wanted to talk to business owners, talk to individuals who were living that um, day to day. I wanted to hear the good and the bad. And so that's why I really wanted to dive into that. Um, in terms of existing businesses though, um, I think this COVID situation has highlighted a couple of things. And I got a couple of stats here um, from a McKinsey report that just came out uh, recently, just around um, the impact COVID-19 is having on minority uh, business owners. Um, so here's a stat here, you know, in uh, 2018 small business credit survey, the Brookings Institution found that large banks approved 60% of loans sought by white small business owners, 50% of those sought by Hispanic or Latinx small business owners, and just 29% of those sought by some black small business owners. And so what we're seeing now is, uh, you know, that those are discouraging numbers. And, and when I see that, um, when take myself out of it, I know when, when people who are I've spoken to who are interested in going into business for themselves and they go through that process and they have those numbers kind of pop out of the system at them, you know, um, good data in, you know, good data out. Essentially, you know, the system isn't, a, you know, allowing for that good data those uh, good outcomes or those good outputs to really, really um, come to fruition right now. And so, you know, that number right there um, just shows we have a lot of work on our hands. Um, I, you know, I commend the uh, Hispanic Latinx uh, small business community um, as well, because they, they've um, somewhat had to go through this, I think a little bit earlier than um, some of us in the black community in terms of, um, figuring out how to, you know, uh, change the change the narrative, you know, change um, the way businesses are um, blended to, you know, they have a lot of, uh, I know the Latinx community, they're big on having their own banks and having uh, institutions in place. Um, so I, I think that that's something uh, we can learn from. But I think the bigger picture is, um, you know, that 60% number uh, 60% of loans sought by white small business owners, you know, those business owners are going to, in a lot of cases, um, big financial institutions. Again, um, we all know the financial institutions that are kind of the household names. You see the uh, ATMs, you see their uh, branches on pretty much uh, every other corner in America. You know, conversations are starting to be had with those institutions as well. So excited to see what those institutions can do there as well. Now, I want to read another stat here. Um, the Federal Reserve, same report, uh, the Federal Reserve banks reported that minority-owned small businesses were significantly more likely to show signs of limited financial health by factors such as profitability, credit scores, and propensity to use retained earnings as a primary funding source. Uh, these companies were approximately twice as likely to be classified at risk or distress that non-minority-owned non small businesses, right? So, you know, there, there's a benchmark set right there. Um, that particularly concerning uh, issue, right, um, impacts a lot of businesses, right? Because, you know, the stat later on in that, in the, in that same kind of uh, takeaway in, in this study says, you know, the, the U.S. Federal Reserve also indicates that distressed companies are three times as likely as healthy businesses to close because of a two-month revenue shock. And uh, what this COVID-19 situation businesses, this could be, this could be, uh, you know, um, 
you know, eight, eight months, you know, minimum for a lot of businesses, right? So that two months pretty much equates to a lot of businesses ultimately going away during this process. And that's what we're seeing, you know, um, we saw, we've all seen the uh, rise, I think unemployment, right? Got up to, uh, what, 30, 40 million people, right? So those are big numbers and, and this situation is impacting that. And uh, the business owners that I'm, uh, that I've had um, conversations with through the first five episodes, they're really, they're really in the heart of it. And they, they, they don't necessarily know this number, these numbers here that I've just um, reported out to you, but they, they feel um, some of those uh, systemic challenges every single day as they're, as they're trying to uh, navigate their business and, and stay open, right? Add value to, to their communities. Um, I think about, uh, you know, uh, my first episode was uh, Leslie's Laundry Fair with um, Dominique. Um, she is uh, really bootstrapping a lot of it because, um, you know, she feels like she, she has to and she, she's in a good spot now. But since she's a small business owner, Leslie's Laundry Care is about, you know, bringing um, uh, your laundry services to your front door. You know, there's no reason for people not to, uh, you know, really um, support her business by, you know, um, right, buying those services. Like, and so I, I think there needs to be somewhat of a, um, a deliberate effort um, by individuals within really all communities, because what I found is that, uh, you know, my, I myself, you know, there is an area, uh, I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina, there are not a lot of, uh, there are not a lot of uh, black owned businesses in my immediate area in my neighborhood. And so what I have to do sometimes um, is I have to, you know, open up that Google and, and just find lists and different ways to uh, to support um, different businesses of people that don't necessarily look like me, right? So I myself, um, through this video, you guys can tell that I'm a, um, I'm a black male, um, but I'm all about supporting, uh, you know, Latinx businesses, uh, businesses um, with uh, founders and owners of, that are women. Uh, you know, I think about Native American, uh, minorities as well, just different groups of people that don't look like me. Like it's very important that you know they have that that access to that American dream of owning something and keeping you know that business open so that they can give give back to their their uh, families and their communities as well. Um, and but it's got to be something. That in a lot of cases, for me, it's got to be delivered. Right? It can't just be me going to the big names that we all shop at. Um, every single day, it, you know, it does take me going an extra couple miles just to get to some of these minority home businesses. And, you know, I just want to commend again, the, the, the business owners, I bring this up, I keep bringing this up, the first five business owners that, you know, I had on my first five episodes, go check that out. Um, but, you know, they're really living it day to day, they're living these stats, they're living this hard situation, and they're, you know, they're navigating through this COVID-19 and, uh, you know, on top of that, you know, we have the uh, racial injustice being spotlighted on uh, George Floyd riots and uh, Breonna Taylor, like there's so many names out there that we could, we could just, you know, state the names for days. Um, but these situations are really putting some stress on uh, the idea of, you know, being able to own a, a successful business um, and be a person of color. Um, and so, you know, uh, with that being said, you know, on the topic of uh, the kind of com the combined impact of COVID-19 and the uh, racial, racial inequalities or racial justice that's being highlighted right now, you know, really what I'm seeing is that, um, you know, um, at first when we, when we saw uh, the George Floyd uh, video, you know, there, I think the initial response was that of anger. Um, and, and, you know, something forceful needing to be done. But I think now the conversations are really transitioned into, you know, how do we make things sustainable for as, as many people as possible in this country for as long as possible moving forward? And so with those conversations, you know, I'm just excited. You know, I've, I've got a couple more business owners lined up. 
uh, to have conversations with. And I know there'll be many more reaching out, but you know, I'm excited to see the dialogue happening right now and just giving entrepreneurs, uh, minorities, uh, founders, owners of color, a platform which is beyond normal where they can, they can, uh, they can release, they can release some of the, the great things that they're doing into the world. And then some of the, the, the roadblocks, the opportunities that they're looking for solutions to. Um, Cause that, I think that'll spur even more businesses, that'll spur, spur more solutions uh, for the economy as a whole. So uh, with, with those two big impacts, COVID and the racial inequalities, I feel like we are, we're, we're, we're stepping up to the challenge as a country um and really across all generations you know I, i'm seeing uh some great dialogue and i hope to continue that um with the beyond normal podcast you know in closing you know i just want to let everyone know uh that i appreciate all the support it's all felt um if you listen to an episode if you like the uh a tweet if you like the linkedin post um you know i appreciate those things there um, if you want to listen to the podcast, um, it'll be available, or it is available on all uh, major streaming platforms, uh, as I Spotify, uh, Apple, uh, Google Podcasts, there's Stitch, there's probably a couple out there as well, other ones as well, but if there's any opportunity for me to add to another platform, let me know, um, and I'll get right on that there. Um, in addition, uh, check us out on YouTube as well now so i'll be posting this video to youtube and then moving forward we'll, we'll have some of that video uh, to go along with the dialogue that you hear from me and the different business owners i think that'll help uh during this time during this uh you know the pandemic that we're in right now everybody's uh on probably conference calls all day anyways for you know work purposes and um that's just something that's probably going to be a part of our new normal moving forward. So I want to make sure that I include that video just to keep that face. I want you guys to connect it, this uh, face here with the voice that you're hearing on the podcast episodes. So, in it, uh, you know, in closing, you know, like I said, I just want to say, you know, I appreciate the support and looking forward to many, many, many more episodes with uh, minority owned business owners. If you have any business owners within your community, or if you are a business owner, you'd like to come on, just shoot me a note um, uh, via LinkedIn. I can be uh, found at uh, Kenneth Groom on LinkedIn, on Twitter, uh, Kenny underscore Groom. Uh, just reach out, you know, uh, wanna have those conversations. They've been uh, really beneficial uh, for all parties as I've been having them so far. So I wanna continue that. Uh, so thanks for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in to the Beyond Normal podcast. I can be reached by cell phone uh, via call or text at 980-263-9921. I'm interested in connecting with other business owners across different industries and looking forward to the conversation.